humility. Friends, if you want to change your life in the best way you can, you have to be humble and you have to be willing to allow God to be number one in your life, in that, in that particular area of your life. The Bible says, if you put God first, he will crown your efforts with success. Okay, well, I'll do that. I'll put God first in finding a job. <laughs> okay, I'll put God first in, in, in my health. I'll put God first in my marriage. I'll put God first in my relationship with my kids. I'll put God first in my finances. Whatever area you're struggling in, you can make a decision today to put God first in your life. And the Bible says he will crown your efforts with success. So now we got to look at what does it look like to put God first. Well, that means you dedicate it to God. You say it's not yours, it's God's. Your job is God's. Your daughter is God's. Your, your marriage belongs to God. Your health is God's. Your body is God's. Your mind is God's. And that's how you do it. You dedicate whatever area that you need help with to God. And you say, okay, God, this is yours. You're managing it now. And then you continually pray over it all the time. And you're humble. If God wants to teach you lessons in a particular area of your life, he's going to need you to be humble so he can teach you those lessons. If you're going to walk around saying, well, I'm, I got it all figured out. Oh, it's okay. I don't, I don't need any help. Everything's fine. Are you humble? No. God can't work with people that aren't humble. He can only work with people that are humble. And, and, but he doesn't give up on you. So what he does when you're not humble and you're prideful is he'll allow you to fall on your face. He'll allow you to suffer the consequences of your own pride and your own ego. That's what God does. In Proverbs 15, 33, it says, Reverence for the Lord is an education in itself. That's an education to have simply reverence for the Lord, to love God and to respect God. But you must be humble before you can receive honors, which means you must be humble before God's going to bless you. You have to be humble before He's going to bless you. If you want to be wise, you have to be humble and teachable. If you don't want to stumble, be humble. I'll repeat, if you don't want to stumble, be humble. That's the way to do it. That's the way to do it. James 4, 6, it says, God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. You know, there's a lot of people here at the Civic Center, a lot of people all over the world that just don't get that lesson. They don't, they don't understand it. They don't, they don't understand why it's so important to be humble to humble ourselves before God. We're stuck there. We can't get past that. And yet we say, say, God, why, God, why? Why don't you give me this? Why don't you give me that? Because we're not humble. We haven't gotten that past that first lesson first. It's all over the world, folks. Only a few people on a daily basis humble themselves before the Lord. They have a quiet time. They know they can't live life on their own. They know they can't live a day without God. They know that if they do, they will fall into their addictions again whether it be pornography, drugs, alcohol, whatever, gambling, food addictions, everybody has something. And we can't live our lives without God. And when we do, we fall into these addictions again. Number four. The fourth thing that Daniel did that made him wise is he refused to fill his mind with garbage. So we must do the same. We must refuse to fill our mind with garbage. Proverbs 15, 14 says, a wise person is hungry for truth while a fool feeds on trash. You know, right now we're studying chemtrails. There's a big, uh, you know, controversy or there's an advocacy on, on stopping the chemtrails, which is, this, you know, the stuff in the sky, the pollution. There's a large group of people that are uh, angry with the pollution in the ocean, right? There's a lot of pollution in the, in the air, in the ocean. Uh, even in our foods, we have a uh, you know, antibiotics and certain things in our foods to keep it lasting longer. A lot of people don't like GMO, uh, gluten, all these things in our foods that are unhealthy. And there's a lot of vocal people about it. But I have yet to see a vocal person against the pollution of the mind. A large group of people that are so strong and, 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 and very vocal about the pollution of the mind. What we're putting into our minds every single day, on the radio, on the TV, in movies, yeah. in magazines, everywhere. We are constant, and on our cell phones now. 
we're constantly distracted with nonsense. I, I can go to a restaurant and I can find half the people on their cell phones when they should be looking across the table, right? Right. Yeah? This is what's happening in our culture right now. We are so distracted with mind pollution that we cannot focus on God. We have the inability to focus on God and it's affecting our lives. There's four categories that uh, we put on the pollution or on actually what we put into our mind. There's four types of food that we put into our mind. The first one is poison food. That's like pornography, right? Those type of things that are poison. They just damage our minds, right? Well, it's uh, natural to have these urges and to look at these things. Well, arsenic is also natural, but it's also poison, right? It may feel natural to want to look at these things, but it's poison. It will poison your mind. Junk food is another thing. Facebook would be considered junk food. If we're on Facebook all the time, or YouTube all the time, looking at all these things all the time, we're just wasting time, right? It's junk food, it's junk food. It's not necessarily bad, but it's just a waste of time. And then we have what's called brain food. Brain food is, uh, would be like reading a, a historical doc or book or something like that, some book on history, right? There's a lot of brain food, like I study history, that's brain food. And then we get to soul food, which is the name of our ministry, soul food. Food that actually feeds the soul. Would the Bible be something that would be soul food, right? Will it actually help you if you apply it? Absolutely. The Bible says the, uh, it, it's, the book is alive. God's word can come alive if we meditate on it, if we read it on a regular basis. And that's what soul food is. And so we, ha whatever you put into your mind will fall into one of those four categories. So my question to you guys is, which one do you spend more, more of your time in? Which food do you devour more than the others? Which is the top of your list? Is it pornography? Is it poison food? Is it junk food? Is it brain food? Or is it soul food? Whatever you put in your mind reflects in your actions and your words. So that's something you can convict us to say, okay, maybe I need to stop looking at all these things on my phone all the time, right? Garbage in, garbage out. You know, it's interesting about food. I like the analogy of food because, you know, people think that food is calories. Yeah, that's true, but it's far more than that. Food is information. It's medicine and it's information. When you eat certain foods, it communicates to your body. It gives it certain nutrients and minerals and it's communicating to your body, right? And it could actually help prevent diseases. It could actually help you. Well, there's some foods that can actually harm you. High fattening foods, high sodium foods, a lot of foods with a lot of sugar. That's also information, but it's bad information for your body. And you can develop some bad diseases from it. So it's interesting how that works. So the same thing with what we put into our minds. You know, we don't think it affects us, but it does because it's information. It's information that can affect our lives. Number five, the final one here is we, we put into practice what we've already learned. Okay, did King Belshazzar do that? No, he didn't. He learned everything from his grandfather, King Nebuchadnezzar, and he didn't do a darn thing. He just wanted to party, and then he lost it all. And I read, he lost his empire the very same day, the very same day that Daniel told him what was gonna happen. That's how quick God works sometimes. And if you haven't learned, if you haven't learned, if you don't apply what you've learned, then you really haven't learned it. If I were to give you a diet book and say, okay, read it, apply it, but you didn't apply it, you haven't really learned it. You haven't really learned it. And you're not a believer in, in Jesus until you start to live out his word. That's where a lot of people get stuck. They think they can read the Bible and pray and that's it. But there's a lot of things God wants us to live out and do and apply. And we got to do it if we're going to really benefit from this Christian life that he wants us to live. So let's look at Daniel 5.22 again. It says, Daniel said, King Nebuchadnezzar, even though you knew all that happened to your father, Nebuchadnezzar, you didn't learn from his life and you still refused to humble yourself before God who rules from heaven. There's a difference between knowing and learning. You can know something but did you learn it? And the book is, the Bible is full of biographies, not fables, but biographies of lives, actual true lives that we can learn from.
the lesson on your notes is this. If I don't humbly learn from the generations before me, I will end up making the same mistakes they did. Let me repeat that in case you missed it. If you don't humbly learn from the generations before you, you will end up making the same mistakes they made. We can have cell phones now. We can have down the road cars that fly or park itself for you. We can have all this technology, but yet the mistakes are still the same. Greed, envy, sin has many different forms to it. These are the same mistakes, relational mistakes. It's the same stuff. And we can't always remember everything we learned. But one thing we can remember is that we were made by God and we were made for God. And until we learn that, nothing will ever make sense. Nothing. This world won't make sense. We won't know why things are the way they are. We won't know why there's people living at the Civic Center. We, want, we won't know why certain people are elected to office. We won't know why bad things happen to good people. We're always going to have these questions and, it's, and life's just going to make no sense and we're not going to know when we die, when we go when we die. We don't know where our family members go when we die, right? We don't have life lessons and life answers that we need, but we have to know we were made by God and for God. And until that, until we learn that, we're always going to have an identity problem. We're always going to struggle with people pleasing. We're always going to fall into what the world says is popular and not what God says. But God wants us to know that we were made by God and for God. 1 Timothy 6.21, it says, Some people have missed the most important thing in life. They don't know God. You can know quantum physics. You can know botany. You can know statistics. You can know all these different um, uh, forms of modalities, all these different topics of science, all these different topics in school. You can give a, you can have so many degrees, they'll call you Dr. Fahrenheit, right? You can be so smart, but if you don't know God, it's all pointless. It doesn't matter. If you don't know God, life won't make any sense. You see, God won't say, show me all your degrees, show me your business card, show me your bank account, show me all your hobbies, show me all the money you've accumulated, Show me all the money you've given to charity. No, he doesn't care about that. What he cares about is what you've done with his son, Jesus Christ. That's what he cares about. And that's what he's going to ask you when you're standing before God after you die. When you're right before God, it's between you and him. He's going to want to know what you did with his son, Jesus Christ, and what you did with the gifts he's given you. Did you squander it? Did you squander your talents? What did you do with your relationships that he's blessed you with? What did you do with your family that he's blessed you with? What have you done with your body? What have you done with your mind? What have you done with the opportunities that God has placed in front of you? That's the question. That's the question. But the most important question is, what have you done with his son, Jesus Christ? That's the question. Is he just a philosophy? Is he considered by you a teacher? a historical figure, or is he the son of God? Does he reign in your life? That's the question. God gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him does not perish, but have eternal life. That's what we need to focus on right now, is God's son. Let me pray a special prayer over, over this right now. <clears throat> Heavenly Father, there's a lot of people here at the Civic Center that may be hearing my voice right now. I don't know how much sunk in. I don't know if they resonated in any way what was said, especially that Mel Trotter story, Lord. But if you're hearing my voice right now, people, I want you in your hearts to pray this. God, maybe I haven't talked to you in a long time. Maybe I used to go to church when I was a kid and I just haven't gone 
anymore. Maybe I've lived life on my own for a very long time without even praying to you, or not consistently for that matter. God, here I am at the Civic Center. I've been living here for some, a long time, some a few weeks. I see a lot of pain here, a lot of hurt here, a lot of addictions here, a lot of anger here. But God, for whatever reason, you're allowing people to come here and preach the good news, your word. Some of it I understand, some of it I don't. Some of it goes over my head, and some of it I really connected with me in some way. But here I am in my life right now, whatever age I am, whatever circumstance I'm in, whatever relationship I may have with my family, estranged or not, here I am in my life at the Civic Center right now. And I'm calling upon you to enter into my life. Fill your spirit from head to toe. Take over my mind, Lord. Enter into my mind. I give your Holy Spirit 24-7 access into my mind so you can help me think noble and good thoughts. I may struggle with an addiction right now. I may be struggling with alcohol, drugs, sex, whatever. But God, with this Mel Trotter story and with this lesson today, I know that it's possible to overcome this through your son's name, Jesus Christ. I know that if I surrender and I humble myself before you, that I can make some changes. Maybe I've been playing God for far too long and it's gotten me here but God I am giving the steering wheel of my life to you you are in control of my life I give it all to you every relationship every body part everything every dollar that I have every talent that I have everything Lord it belongs to you and I trust you that you will make sense of my life. My life is maybe broken in a million pieces, but God, I trust you that you're gonna put me back together again, stronger than I was before. I don't know what's gonna happen. I don't know what it's gonna look like, but God, right now I commit my life to you. So lead me the right way. Lead me away from myself in a direction that you want me to go. And I trust you, God. Even though I don't know exactly where you're leading me, I trust you that you are leading me to higher grounds, to a better life. God, maybe for whatever reason, I've been resistant of getting help at the courtyard. For whatever reason, I just have not wanted to go to the court. Maybe I go there for food, but I don't want to get the services there. Humble me, God. Help me to stop playing God in my own recovery, in my own life. If I can humble myself before you and trust you, you might, you might lead me to the courtyard and I might get help that I need. Where do you want me to go, God? Do you want me to stay here? Or do you want me to make steps to getting on my feet again, Lord Jesus? I don't know, but I trust that you'll tell me. So God, be with me this week. And the next time I'm tempted to do bad, speak to me, God, in a mighty way and say, quote, that is not the way I want you to go. There is a better way. Take my hand. Let me show you. So God, thank you for, for this message. Thank you for your word. Bless everybody here at the Civic Center, everybody that hasn't heard my voice and that is hearing my voice. Bless us all right now. Be the light that is shining so brightly here at the Civic Center. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's hear it for those that prayed that for the first time. So friends, I want to encourage you to just be that light here at the Civic Center. Right? Talk to somebody. If you see somebody that's sitting by themselves, just talk to them. There needs to be more love and compassion here at the Civic Center. There needs to be more love and compassion. So with that said, guys, thanks for coming. We're going to be going over to the courtyard now to doing our open share. Come and grab some food. 
and uh, we'll see you over there. All right, guys, God bless.